This is the third part for today's lecture on the reproducing Colonel Hilbert space. A complicated name, but uh, very important in machine learning today. First of all, let's see now the formal definition of what we understand as uh, a, a kernel function. So uh, a function k is a kernel if and only if it is symmetric and if there exists some Hilbert space h and a map phi where if we first do the feature expansion by phi and then take the inner product from the Hilbert space h then we exactly recover this kernel here. And uh, the x, uh, so the, the original features, this doesn't have to be a real feature space. So here we can also have uh, nominal entries, for example red, blue and green or you know like zip codes something that, that has no real order and uh, or other complicated objects like for example graphs or, or other things that are that are difficult to describe in is just a single vector. Um, all of these could also be in, in our uh, set big X and we can have a valid kernel over that. Um, now what we want to show is that a certain uh, kernel actually has these properties and in, in one of the direction it's really easy. So if we have the mapping phi and also the inner product, then we can just construct the kernel and we know it has to be a kernel, it fulfills these properties. The other direction is a little bit more complicated. So if we have a kernel function that is already compressed, how can we show that there exists a phi and some inner product uh, that exactly reconstructs our k? And um, this is what we're talking about in this uh, section of the course. Uh, but first of all, let's see uh, a couple more consequences and properties that, that kernels have before we then go into this part of, of uh, looking at an individual function k and, and seeing whether it is indeed a kernel. So um, let's apply the kernel function to uh, pairs from a data set. And uh, this gives us a kernel matrix or a, a gram matrix um, and uh, this actually corresponds also to the gram matrix that we had seen in the course on, um, on vector spaces. Uh, so now if we here have our points y1 to yn we can uh, construct an n by n matrix where we have the, the, the kernel, kernelized entries uh, for, for every combination of points in our data set. And, and this matrix K, it has uh, some importance for us. And uh, we can prove a couple of things uh, for this matrix K. First of all, um, if the kernel function, or if, if small K is an actual kernel function, then the Gram matrix will always be positive semi-definite. And uh, we can show this in just uh, three lines. And uh, furthermore, it will be symmetrical, and the symmetry it just follows immediately from from the symmetry of, of small k, the kernel function. Okay. Now, consider that we have a function small k at hand, and uh, here we have these x, and uh, the the big x could be some actual uh, vector space, or it could be just a set of of, of nominal entries. And um, what we now do is we partially evaluate this kernel function small k uh, with just one entry. Yeah? So the kernel function small k, it takes two arguments and we just give it one argument. So now this, this y here is, is fixed and it still requires this second argument dot. Yeah? So by partially evaluating, we get a new function that takes only a single input argument. Yeah. So this uh, k of y and dot, uh, we can now see it as a function with a single argument that goes in the place of the dot. Yeah. And, and the y is now, is now a fixed scalar or a fixed entry from, from, from big X. And okay, so similar things, you've probably seen that uh, in your studies of computer science, so many functional programming languages, they also do the same. And uh, it, you might uh, know this under the name of currying, but this, this partial evaluation, it's actually quite common. Okay, and now what we say is that the, the feature expansion with the phi 
the feature expansion with the phi, we now take for it the partial evaluation of our function k, uh, ky. Okay, and now something really funny happens because originally our feature expansion it went from some low dimensional feature space to some really high dimensional feature space. So here with D a lot bigger than, than N. So this, this originally happened. Yeah? And now we do something different. So now we take our feature, which, which we now call uh, from the feature space uh, big X. And now we also do this expansion, but we do the expansion to a function space. Because now the result of here the phi is a function. And um, so this is our uh, expansion and uh, we now have to also define an inner product and we already have seen inner products for function spaces. So for example, the, the L2 space that was considered in the course on, on, on vector spaces. And now we, we actually, we could choose many inner products that could work on the functions going from, from X to R. So, so these guys here, these guys here, these are all the functions going from X to R. And um, so there are many inner products that we could choose, but we choose a very particular one. And uh, what we do is we choose an inner product where if we take two expanded feature vectors, yeah, which are then these partially evaluated functions kx dot and ky dot, then we define the inner product to be actually here the kernel. Uh, and this is a, a design choice and this will prove to be, to be very useful. Okay, um, but this is so far not yet a full-fledged vector space um, because we might only have a, a finite number of elements in our, um, in our set big X. And that would mean we only have a finite number of, um, of partially evaluated kernel functions. And uh, that is not an actual vector space, but we need a vector space. So we need it to be a vector space so that it can be a Hilbert space for, for, for the kernel. Okay, but now what we do is we take these, um, um, these expanded uh, these expanded uh, feature vectors and see them only as the basis for the vector space that we are going to construct. And the vector space we are going to construct, here it's called G, and it contains all the linear combinations or the affine combinations of, uh, no, linear combinations, so, so the weighted sums of all the um, of all the partially evaluated functions that we could generate from our big X. And now this is a true vector space. So we can take the functions and we can add them and we can multiply them with a scalar and so on. And uh, by saying, okay, um, all the guys coming from big X, they're just the basis. And we, uh, well, and, and it generates a full vector space. Then uh, this is the vector space we're, we're going to work on. And also the, the inner product that we've seen up here, yeah, so this inner product, uh, we're also extending it to work on this uh, full-fledged vector space G, uh, because here then we also have just uh, the weighted linear combinations or the weighted sums of the, of the entries. And this just uh, 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 translates over in a way that in the end we have a weighted combination of our uh, kernel function evaluated at uh, the, 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 the basis coming from the original big X. Okay, so this is, this is quite a step. Huh? So here we do the, the expansion with phi into a function space. And then on this function space, we have a, um, a, an inner product and the inner product is actually giving us or is defined as um, this kernel function uh, small k 
um, in uh, for for all the elements coming directly from 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 big X. Okay. And now finally the reproducing kernel Hilbert space. Now um, we can check now that this uh, inner product that we have defined that it holds the inner product axioms. Uh, and there are three inner product axioms that were shown in the lecture on vector spaces. So first of all, linearity, so addition and scalar multiplication in the first argument. And uh, here by, by looking at the defini definition here of this um, inner product, um, it is clear that we have linearity in the first argument. First of all, we have symmetry. And uh, we have symmetry when our kernel small k is symmetric as well. And second of all, uh, positive definiteness. So um, the inner product of x and x is always larger than zero, and it is always equal to zero if the two axes are exactly here in the null vector. So this here should be a bold null. Okay. And uh, so we need this property for, for small k as well, so that we have the same property then for the, for the, for the uh, inner product on, on g. And uh, by consequence, um, every symmetric positive definite function is a valid kernel. So in, on the previous slide here, we started with this k. Yeah, and um, actually, what we have now seen are the requirements that we have for this small k in order that uh, here it generates a valid inner product on this function space. Okay. And uh, well, these are then the um, th these are then uh, therefore all the the requirements that we have for a small k to be a valid kernel, and they are not very complicated. So we only require it to be uh, symmetric and to be positive definite, and and then we're good. Okay. And now, where does this reproducing stuff come from? Why is a why is it called reproducing kernel Hilbert space? So. Um, let um, big F a Hilbert space of functions from X to R. Then we call it a reproducing kernel Hilbert space if there exists a kernel small k such that the kernel evaluated, so for any X that we can select, the partial evaluation of k is element of F. Yeah? And if uh, the partial evaluation of k is element of F, then we can apply the inner product to it. And now comes the funny part. If we then take the inner product of f with the partially evaluated kernel at x, then we exactly get out f of x. And uh, well, this is um, now the, 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 the reproducing property. And uh, what we see is that the, the Hilbert space G that we have just constructed, it exactly also has this reproducing property. And we can prove this in a single line. Yeah. So let's take here f and k partially evaluated at x and the inner product of the two. And then uh, obviously the f I can replace with a weighted sum of um, uh, with a weighted sum of uh, partially evaluated uh, kernel functions. So because every element of our big G here is a partial combination of these basis elements that are partially evaluated kernel functions. So here I'm just replacing f with uh, the sum over alpha i and then the partially evaluated kernel functions. I pull the alpha i out in front. Um, I simplify a little bit more and then I end up with this function here with, which is exactly f of x. Okay. Um, okay, and there's a, there's a nice proof from Argonschein uh, that showed that for every kernel small k, there is a unique reproducing kernel Hilbert space corresponding to it. Uh, and, and that means um, for every kernel the, where the kernel function is symmetric and positive definite, uh, not only is this enough to show that it is a kernel function, but it is also um, um, generating a unique reproducing kernel Hilbert space. Okay. 
And now we can also combine several kernels. Now we have seen conditions that we need for kernels and uh, there are ways to combine kernels that uphold these. Yeah? And uh, you can look at the literature there are in Shellkopf and uh, others, there are descriptions of how to select kernels and, and what are good kernels and what are the properties of them that we want to have. Um, and uh, we have a, a couple of rules where we know we can just blindly apply these rules and the end result will still be a kernel. For example, we can multiply any kernel uh, with, a, with a positive scalar. The end result will still be a kernel function. Will, will still be positive, definite and still be symmetric. We can add a constant. We can also add two kernels together. We can even multiply two kernels together. Um, we can take a polynomial with positive coefficients of the kernel function and uh, uh, the exponential also. Yeah? And uh, also this kernel cookbook. Um, so if you are looking to use an SVM and you have maybe difficulties in applying uh, or in finding a kernel that exactly um, 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 uh, recovers the, 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 the decision boundary you're looking for, um, the, the kernel cookbook is, is probably going to be, be helpful there. Okay, so what have we learned today? We saw, um, well, we learned about linear classification and uh, different algorithms that can be used there. The perceptron algorithm and the SVM, which has the advantage of being uh, absolutely deterministic and finding uh, a very robust decision boundary if the classes are linearly separable. And if that's not the case, then we might have to go to nonlinear classification and there the kernel trick is very helpful uh, because uh, we, we don't lose too much efficiency by going into very high dimensional spaces uh, by this nonlinear transformation. Okay, and um, well, we can use the Lagrangian dual for the SVM to, to, to efficiently do that. Uh, furthermore, we saw the rules for kernel functions to be actually kernels. So, Kernel functions have to be symmetric and uh, positive definite. And why is, this, why is this the case? The reproducing kernel Hilbert space explains this to us because we first project or expand the, um, um, the, the features that we have into a function space and then we do the linear uh, classification in the function space, which is kind of advanced. And then there are ways to combine these kernels in order to uh, well, have uh, combine kernels with, with properties that, that we like. That's it for today and uh, see you soon in the next lecture. The next lecture will be on um, conic programming.